Hello, everyone. My name is Tracy Craighead, and I'm one of your hosts for tonight from the Big Tent. Welcome. For those of you who are new to the Big Tent, it was founded by a group of women in 2019 as a moderate political advocacy organization focused on protecting the rights of all Americans, encouraging civic engagement, and promoting smart and effective governance. Big Tent has ongoing events posted on the website, and our next talk will be with Michigan Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, who will be joining us on Tuesday, May 10th at 12 noon to discuss threats to Michigan's voting rights and why such threats matter to all of us. And now for tonight, the, the Big Tent is honored to welcome as our spotlight speaker, former ambassador to Ukraine and newest best-selling author, Maria Yovanovitch. She will be in conversation with Mila Atmos, the producer and series host of a weekly podcast called Future Hindsight that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for everyday citizens to affect positive change. Lastly, I thought I'd share a fun fact about tonight with you all, which is that the ambassador, Mila, and I are all graduates from the Kent School in Connecticut. And interestingly, Mila actually had the ambassador's mother as her German teacher while a student at Kent. And Mila has shared how during that time, the ambassador was already a rising star at the State Department. And she revealed, quote, we all aspire to be just like her. So with that, I'll ask Mila to take it from here. Oh, no, I can't hear her. I'm, I'm muted. Sorry, sorry. That's a, it's a rookie mistake. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tracy Craighead, Vanessa Thomas, Kitty Douglas, uh, Susan Lehman, and all the staff at Big Tent USA for putting this event together. And thank you to all Big Tent aficionados for tuning in today. And we're also recording this conversation for my podcast, Future Hindsight. So welcome to those listeners, too. Uh, and I'm going to be weaving in some excellent questions from the audience who sent over some really incisive questions in advance when they registered. We're thrilled to welcome Ambassador Maria Ivanovich this evening to, to discuss her memoir, Lessons from the Edge, which details her illustrious career, her courage and integrity, and her patriotic dedication and service to the United States. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a thrill to be here. And it's you know, in the small, it's such a small world that all three of us uh, went to the same high school. Well, as Tracy mentioned, I was lucky enough to know your mother. Uh, she was my German teacher, as Tracy said, in a class of only two students. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of quality time with her. She was always so kind to me. And, um, you know, I was a slightly lost foreign student at boarding school. So I wanted to start with that. She was incredible. She was an incredible woman and always so kind. And I remember with much fondness. But I also wanted to start with your parents because of their story and how it is the start of your own story. They were refugees. Your mother had mm -hmm. been a stateless person and also your father. And how did their experiences influence your path to becoming a diplomat? Well, thank you for asking about my parents because uh, in writing this book, I really wanted to honor them. Um, they had incredible lives and were just exemplary um, people in so many ways. But, you know, they started out, as you said, as stateless uh, refugees in Europe during and after World War II and made their way to Canada and then ultimately the United States and sort of ended up in this lovely little town of Kent, Connecticut, um, where they brought up um, my brother and myself. <clears throat> and they were just always so grateful that they had refuge in the United States where they could um, they could worship as they wanted to. They could say what they wanted to. They had freedom. Uh, there was rule of law. There weren't going to be arbitrary arrests for unknown things. And um, we had opportunities. You know, if you worked hard um, and you, you know, did well in school, that's what we were told, you could, you could, you know, you could have the American dream. And uh, they believed in that because they knew what it was like to live under autocracy. And they knew what the value of living in a democracy was. And that's the way they brought us up. And so, you know, they told us we were fortunate. Uh, and so we needed to give back. I mean, I believe that my parents as, you know, teachers at Kent School, 
they gave back, you know, not only in the classroom, but also I think they taught many of their students lessons in life. Uh, and, you know, in terms of taking people into our home and, you know, just talking them through, you know, some of the challenges of being a teenager, frankly. <laughs> and, um, you know, they, they were always giving back. And so my brother and I were brought up in that tradition. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to do, I thought about the Foreign Service. I took some detours along the way, as one does. And uh, then in, um, when I was living in New York, I finally decided that what I was doing was just not that interesting to me, you know, and I wanted to um, marry up my interest in uh, history and politics and traveling and meeting people from other cultures uh, with, uh, with my desire to give back and to serve the American people. And that's totally from my parents. That's really wonderful. For sure, your parents always gave back. I was often invited to a home-cooked meal as opposed to a cafeteria meal, so I always appreciated that. Well, there is something about how those experiences really engender, right, an appreciation for and dedication to democracy and to diplomacy. And I think about how proud your parents must have been that you have espoused their values and, you know, taken them to your tremendous service for this country. So I have a question about Ukraine and your work there, which was a continuation of a career long focus on anti-corruption. Why has that always been so central to your work? And what were the challenges Ukraine in particular was facing? Yeah, so, you know, when I wrote this book, I actually realized how, um, you know, the patterns in your life <laughs> and that at, in almost every post that I was in, there were issues of corruption that we had to deal with in one way or another. But in Somalia, in Ukraine, the first time I was there from 2001 to 2004, at least as far as I knew as a you know, relatively junior uh, employee in, in Somalia, and as a more senior person, the number two at the embassy uh, when I was in Ukraine for the first time, corruption was not a part of what we really discussed. I mean, we understood that it was there, but it's not something that we discussed. It wasn't part of our assistance programs in terms of trying to help uh, the host uh, country uh, deal with it. Um, I think there was a sense at that time that, you know, this was something we just needed to navigate around. And so, um, but then, you know, moving forward, uh, when I came back to Ukraine in 2016, after the revolution of dignity, after the Ukrainian people themselves, had said, you know, this is something super important. We need to stop this and we need help in, in, in getting this done. Um, this became not only part of the Ukrainian government's policy after that revolution, it became a part of uh, our policy as well. And so um, I'd like to say that it was all me, <laughs> but in fact, it wasn't because, you know, I am an employee for the US government. I fall, follow, even as an ambassador, you know, you, um, have some input into the policy process, but then you implement the US government policy. And so that's what I was doing. And frankly, we were all in on that because we could see the damage that corruption was causing to, to Ukraine. Um, and you know, if, that, if corruption weakens one of our partner countries, that weakens the relationship because that country is not as reliable a partner. Uh, it's not a good business partner for our businesses. Um, and so we were all in, in, in terms of trying to help Ukraine, um, you know, do something about that problem. Right. So you were really doing the good work of the United States and spreading non-corruption in their governments and building real democracy. Well, working um, with the Ukrainian government and with Ukrainian yes. civil society. Right, right. So why is corruption so corrosive in your experience? Well, I think what happens is uh, that um, in authoritarian regimes, you see um, leaders um, feeling that they are entitled and that they should you know, be able to, um, to benefit from you know, basically the, uh, the, the country's coffers and the, 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 the resources and the taxes that are accrued and you know, all the funding streams that are really the, you know, they belong to the, to the people of that country, whether it's the people of Ukraine or the people of Somalia. Um, but you know, greedy authoritarian leaders always feel that they are entitled. And they sometimes, they most often 
um, confuse the state with themselves. And so if it's the states, then you know it must be theirs and it must all be okay. And they need lots of money because once you start stealing and start that system, you also need to spread it around to certain of your um, you know, colleagues, henchmen, whatever you wanna call them, to keep them loyal and engaged and um, supportive of you. And, and it never ends, right? Because um, you're always insecure because what you're doing is wrong. And you're building up other enemies on the other side, your political opponents, the people of the country who, you know, instead of uh, the money of the country uh, going to um, provide services, you know, a good, good education for kids or building roads or, uh, you know, cleaning up the water supply. I mean, whatever governments are supposed to do, I mean, governments, the purpose of government is not having a government. The purpose of government <laughs> is to provide services to the people. And um, that wasn't happening in Somalia. It wasn't happening in many of the countries of the former Soviet Union, including Russia, and, um, and of course, Ukraine. And so it's, it's extremely corrosive because then what happens is it breeds all, sort of, all sorts of, you know, that kind of theft um, breeds all sorts of resentment. And then you start getting petty corruption because when, um, when, when there are no services in a country, I mean, people are gonna find a way, whether they live in Mogadishu or someplace else. And so um, I'll, I'll just give you an example. When I was in Russia in the 1980s, I mean, this was you know, a, a relatively prosperous time for the Soviet Union. But if you lived uh, in a new housing complex in the outskirts of Moscow, so you were already in Moscow, so you were already lucky. Um, there was a three year waiting list to get a phone installed in your new apartment. And that was in the day before cell phones. So this was a huge problem. And, um, but you know, people figured it out. You know, they find, you know, the telephone guy who was, you know, working in their district and they would give him something a little extra on the side and he would bump them up to the top of the list. And then somebody else, you know, pays that person. And, um, you know, you, you, you want the good medicine for your child who is sick from Western Germany, which is only available for the elites, um, but you pay the doctor to give you that on the side. And so there's this whole parallel system of corruption when the government and, and in, in the Soviet Union uh, doctors, pretty much everybody was a, an employee of the state. They would, um, there was this whole parallel system to, for individuals to get what they needed to keep themselves and their families going. Um, when actually what you could do is you could just, you know, actually provide, the, the government could just provide those services, but that's not what was happening in the Soviet Union and it was not what was happening, you know, in the early years in any of these countries. So your work in helping in partnership with these other governments to combat corruption, when did you start especially in Ukraine, when did you start to have the sense that your work was attracting maybe the wrong kind of attention? Well, um, I mean, when you're working on anti-corruption issues, it's always a sensitive issue because um, powerful people are um, you know, making money on corruption and they don't like it when, um, when they're either not necessarily even being called out, but when those money streams stop. And so they're going to put roadblocks in the way. I mean, they may be, um, you know, government ministers, they may be powerful oligarchs, they have to say the right things. Um, but, you know, they talk the talk, but they don't necessarily walk the walk. And in fact, often they are blocking things. And this is honestly to be expected. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've been working on this for a number of years, and we continue to do it. Um, I knew that not everybody was happy with the efforts of the U.S. Embassy and me, you know, in charge of the embassy. Um, I didn't know <laughs> how, how much they didn't like it, um, and uh, really until the end of 2019. I mean, there had been all these rumors that people were asking about me and that Lutsenko, the prosecutor general who was um, the equivalent of, uh, well, sort of the rough equivalent of our attorney general, that, um, that he was you know, not happy with me out to get me, et cetera, et cetera. But until the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019, I didn't really understand how serious it was and that um, those in Ukraine who were unhappy with me had um, met up with, hooked up with 
um, actors in the United States, including President, former President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, and that he had his own whole own set of issues um, that he wanted to pursue, specifically finding dirt on um, former Vice President Biden, uh, who was thought to be the front runner uh, against, uh, against President Trump in, in the next uh, presidential elections. So I'm wondering if you can describe for us something that may be indescribable. What's it like as a career diplomat to find yourself at the center of a huge domestic political storm? You know, Giuliani basically running an errand for former President Trump. Um, what was that like? Yeah, political errand in the, in the words of Fiona Hill. Um, well, it was, um, it was, uh, you know, I, I guess uncomfortable is uh, the most diplomatic way one can put it. Um, but, you know, career diplomats, public servants, we serve Republican administrations and Democratic Institute uh, administrations. Um, you know, we are a democracy in the United States and the people elect the president and the president, um, he or she, um, sets their own foreign policy. There can be a vigorous debate uh, on foreign policy about what that might be and what that might look like. But once a, a direction is set, um, you know, US government employees are expected to, um, to follow that policy. And if you can't follow that policy, then uh, you, know, you need to decide how you would register dissent, um, including you know, perhaps even resigning. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, there's no employee in the U.S. government that agrees with everything that a particular administration does. And so you have to decide your threshold. I mean, these are all judgment calls that, um, you know, different people make in different ways. Um, but it's, um, you know, I felt, you know, for myself that actually the Trump foreign policy, I mean, the official policy, not the political errand <laughs> parallel foreign policy, um, was actually pretty good. It was a continuation of the Obama foreign policy. Um, you know, there was a strong emphasis on anti-corruption. You know, it was all the same things. And in fact, Trump, after much persuasion, uh, at the end of his first year in office, he agreed to send um, Ukrainians javelins, which were, um, so the anti-tank missiles that we've heard so much about recently, um, which the Obama administration had not wanted to do. So it was actually a, a, a toughening up of our policy, which I, I welcomed. So, you know, I was alert to, you know, is there anything going on that, you know, I would be uncomfortable with, but, um, you know, for, for at least the early years, um, like I said, it was a continuation of the policy that had been, and I thought it was pretty strong. Yeah. Um, so you're saying that the foreign policy was, the policy in and of itself was not the problem, but the but the side policy or the parallel policy, uh, it actually has like an almost movie thriller script quality when you read it. And it must have been so strange to be fighting corruption in foreign lands as a foreign service officer of the United States, only to find that your own president is using the power of the state for his personal interests. Um, so this is when I wanna ask you one of the excellent questions submitted by the audience. And that is, what can we do to keep a future president from dismantling our US diplomatic efforts in order to personally benefit himself or herself, family yeah. and inner circle of cronies? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it goes beyond dismantling foreign policy, it goes to domestic policy as well. That um, you know what, what I had seen overseas where people were using the power of their office to benefit themselves in one way or another. Um, that um, in the Trump administration, we were doing the same thing here. That was really devastating for me to see. And it was um, you know, a real blow to our national security when it became so public that um, bad actors around the world could see that you could make a deal here. You know, if, if you don't like um, you know, that pesky ambassador that's <laughs> pursuing uh, the policy of the United States, you, you, you can probably make a deal here. That is not in our national interests. And, um, and so it was, it was really devastating. So what do we do about it? I think in the first instance, um, you need to, <laughs> we need to elect the right elected representatives. I mean, what we found under the Trump administration is that, um, issues that we thought were settled law, that there were laws and regulations about this, actually no, they were just standards that we had. They were expectations that we had. 
that you know over 200 years previous presidents had met and and president trump did not and so you know surprisingly some of the things that he did were actually legal even though they did not meet the expectations of um, many of the American people. And so uh, I think, you know, there are some efforts to codify um, in law uh, some of these things. So the, the one example I can think of is um, how does it work when, um, you know, once the um, college uh, electors votes are brought to, um, to the Congress, the House of uh, Representatives, to count the vote, uh, to make sure there's no question um, about that process as um, was raised um, back in um, uh, 20, uh, I guess that was 2021, after the 2020 uh, elections that Donald Trump still does not accept he lost. Yeah, so following on that thought, I feel like, you know, we're talking about the election having uh, been um, quote unquote, stolen, and that people even are going to try to overturn the results. So the Trump years were really very revealing in terms of showing that institutions are in the end made up of fallible people and wobbly norms. You've talked about how betrayed you felt by the way you were hung out to dry basically by Pompeo's State Department. And this was an institution that you had dedicated your life and career to. How has it changed the way you think about America's institutions and that and that institution in particular, the State Department? Yeah. So I, I still think, you know, I mean, I spent a career telling people overseas and telling myself that we have strong institutions and, you know, that's why we have a strong democracy. But as you said, it turns out our institutions need. Um, us as employees, as citizens, as much as we need those strong institutions. And so it's, um, I think part of it is the, in the intake process to make sure that we are hiring people who, you know, are good at their jobs, are experts in their fields, um, but also are people of integrity that are going to do the right thing when the going gets tough. And that those, um, you know, those norms, those um, expectations of how we behave are, 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 you know, part of the air that we breathe at the State Department or at other institutions. Um, because the thing is, I mean, you never, certainly at the State Department and foreign policy, you never know what the next, um, you know, what the, what the next challenge is going to be. It's not like there's like, you know, it's, a, B, C, D, these are the four problems that you're going to have, and you can pick from one, two, three, four for how to solve it. There is no roadmap. Um, and so we need to make sure that we are hiring people with a strong ethical basis and with, um, with really good judgment to kind of, you know, uh, sort through everything because, because it isn't clear. And I think that often the choices that we make in foreign policy and, and in personnel issues and, and you know, any kind of a, a, of, a, of a challenge, you know, it's not like there is a right, clear right choice and a clear wrong choice, and we just need somebody who's going to pick the obvious right choice. That's not the way it works. Um, you know, often, uh, certainly in foreign policy, there are shades of gray, and there are, you have incomplete knowledge. Uh, I mean, I think now of Putin right now, everybody's wondering what's in his head, what's he going to do? We don't really know. Uh, and so, and yet we need to, to meet this challenge and do the best that we can with imperfect knowledge when the stakes are super, super high. Um, so, you know, that's not the challenge that most employees are going to face, but, um, you know, they need to get it right on the little things, um, because that also, uh, lays the basis for the decisions they make, you know, as those, um, problems, the problem set becomes harder and more challenging and there is greater pressure. Um, so uh, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to actually provide a, a specific answer to your question, um, but I would say that we just need to look for um, people of integrity and bring them up and, and, and reward that. Yeah. So you just mentioned Putin. Russia mm -hmm. invaded Ukraine, right, on February 24th, which shocked the world for the most part. Everybody talked about it like 
was going to happen, but then everybody thought, no, it was really not going to happen. So were you shocked? Well, um, I was shocked uh, in the beginning because when I was in uh, Ukraine, uh, I mean, there was a hot war in the Donbass that had never stopped. Two to three individual Ukrainian individuals were killed every week, civilians, uh, soldiers. So I thought that Putin, I hoped that Putin would be uh, satisfied with destabilizing Ukraine with that kind of you know, smaller hot war in the East, um, with the um, cyber attacks against Ukrainian infrastructure, which you know, caused billions of dollars of damage in the West as well, um, with the disinformation, with the assassination attacks on Ukraine's leaders right in the heart of the capital. I mean, can you think of anything more destabilizing if there were assassinate, assassination attempts at you know, key key members of the US government in Washington. I mean, that's pretty frightening. Um, you know, and, and the list goes on. Uh, I had hoped uh, that that would be enough for Putin. But, you know, so I was really surprised when we saw, you know, that buildup in, in the fall. But in the fall, when, you know, it was clear, I mean, there were hundreds of, uh, well, almost 200,000 um, men uh, and, you know, countless uh, equipment uh, on three sides of Ukraine, I mean, then it became very, very clear to me uh, that there was going to be an invasion. I mean, you don't do this uh, just to threaten, you do this to act. I was in Ukraine at the beginning of February of this year, right before the invasion, and it was startling to me that um, there was not, um, that, you know, President Zelensky did not publicly, at least, seem to think that there was going to be an attack. So, well, now that we've been at this for some time, or rather the war in Ukraine has been going on for some time now, uh, and it's looking more and more like a protracted conflict. And with each day, it feels as though the incredibly high stakes just get higher, right? Like nuclear weapons, global food security, energy security, and also a test for international cooperation and tenacity on sanctions. What do you think about the U.S. response? Is the U.S. doing enough? Or actually, here is an audience member who had maybe a better way of asking this same question. What are your views of the right course of action that the U.S. should take right now in supporting Ukraine? Yeah. So, you know, this is a really tricky question because, you know, my heart says, you know, we need to go in there and we need to sort it out. Um, but my head says, um, you know, where the Biden administration is right now, which is that um, they are navigating this very, very narrow lane uh, between trying to support our NATO allies, the frontline states like Poland, uh, trying to provide as much support, you know, whether it's economic, whether it's humanitarian, whether it's security assistance, whether it's intelligence assistance uh, to Ukraine uh, to fight off the Russians. Uh, and then um, doing what we can with sanctions and like to deter, uh, to deter Russia. Um, so on the one hand, trying to do all of that without widening this war uh, and making the issue, um, you know, the situation perhaps even, even more complicated and even more dangerous. And so I think, you know, the president is trying to manage the risks uh, while doing all those tasks. And I think it's very difficult because we don't necessarily know where Putin is. I mean, you know, so we have probably a battalion of lawyers, maybe even more thinking about, you know, what is provocative? And, you know, I, I wanna scream and say, what is provocative is Russia invading Ukraine. That's what's provocative. And anything that Ukraine does in response and that the allies, including the US does in response, you know, is just meeting that challenge. But of course, you know, that's not the world we live in. We need to manage the risk because we are responsible countries, unlike Russia. Um, but we can't let ourselves be deterred because Putin is a bully. And, um, you know, it's my belief that um, all he understands is strength. And when we sort of pull ourselves back from actions that might be reasonable and uh, completely appropriate. He sees it as a sign of weakness, not as we are responsible members of the international community and we don't wanna make an already toxic 
a terrible situation even worse. And I'll tell you why I think that. Um, so, you know, back in um, uh, 1999, when, uh, when Putin was the prime minister to President Yeltsin, um, he um, basically conducted the second Chechen war and it was brutal and it was terrible. Uh, thousands of people died, including many elderly Russian people who were living in the capital of Chechnya. And as far as I know, um, as a very junior officer at that time, we barely protested. And there were certainly no actions. You know, this was an internal Russian issue. Uh, and then fast forward to 2008, and um, President Putin uh, and the Russian government, um, they uh, fomented a war against Georgia, one of their neighbors, and they took two chunks of territory from Georgia. And we, um, we protested, um, but we did not implement any sanctions. And we did not um, excommunicate um, Yeltsin in any way. You, know, you still received in international circles. So fast forward again to 2014, the first Ukraine war, um, Putin illegally annexed Crimea. He invaded Donbass in the east, which he's, you know, he is now much in the news. And then we did protest. Uh, we did uh, kick uh, Yeltsin, uh, I'm sorry, Putin out of the uh, G7, uh, the G8, so it became the G7. And we instituted a number of sanctions. It took us a little while, but we instituted sanctions. And it's my belief uh, that that is why Putin stopped uh, where he stopped in Donbas. But he used the eight years between 2014 and the reinvasion of Ukraine in 2022 to you know, build up his war chest, to build up his military, apparently not very successfully, um, and um, you know, basically make press preparations so he could withstand whatever might come his way. And Putin basically miscalculated um, because the West turned out to be more united under, West, uh, under US leadership. The Russian military turned out to be a disaster, um, in part because of corruption, and we can come back to that. Um, and the Ukrainian military, which knew why it was fighting. I mean, this is an existential fight for Ukraine, uh, turned out to be way more motivated and way more capable uh, than Vladimir Putin had realized. So um, yeah, so, so that's where we are. Yeah, that is where we are. You, well, you're saying that Putin miscalculated and um, his war chest is not as strong, whether that's the money or the people, the, you know, the troops on the ground. Uh, are not as strong as he may have thought they were. So are you worried then that this war can spread westward? Well, sure. I think we all need to be worried uh, about miscalculations for one thing, you know, an errant uh, drone going off and ending up in Poland and killing a number of people. Um, there, you know, there are always mistakes on the battlefield. Um, and then there are always calculations. So. Um, you had asked me before about nuclear weapons, and I mean, I think that's a very serious concern when you have the president of uh, a nuclear state like Russia and his foreign minister loosely talking about, um, you know, nuclear war. Uh, that is, um, you know, again, very provocative, and it's meant to deter us, but that doesn't mean that it isn't concerning. Um, and so, you know, we know that the U.S. military and NATO is looking at this very carefully. I mean, I'm encouraged that um, what we hear from our military is that they're not seeing the kind of um, movements that they would expect to see if Russia was actually going to launch a nuke. Um, but today, you know, I heard on the news, um, and I, I suspect we'll hear more from this, um, you know, from the U.S. government and from NATO, uh, that in Kaliningrad, a, a small portion of Russia, which is separated from the mainland of, uh, of Russia, that they had sort of a mock drill that included a nuclear attack. Now, Kaliningrad is bordered by, you know, the Baltic states, and uh, I believe also by Poland. Very provocative, very worrisome for those populations. So, you know, what does that mean? Uh, and, you know, I wish I had a great answer for you. But we can't allow Putin to bully us into saying, okay, you got nukes and we're not going to do anything because that will only embolden him to do more. He's already told us on the eve of uh, the invasion of Ukraine that he thinks there are other countries that should also join, rejoin the fold uh, the, of Mother Russia. 
And that, um, and so, you know, if, if we, if we say, you know, this is too dangerous, that doesn't mean that he's going to put all his nukes away and all of a sudden he's going to be an upstanding international citizen. It just means he's going to do more. That's what we've seen over the last 20 years. I have a question about, um, you know, you were there at the beginning, basically, of the unraveling of the Soviet Union. And so to rejoin Mother Russia in a way, how do people on the ground actually feel about that? You know, you spend so much of your time on the ground in these countries. Do they actually, and I know that people say that here in the news, that, oh, you know, uh, that this is a righteous war and um, that they should go back into the fold. How do um, people actually so that would be ground? people in Russia. People, no, people, uh, no, not people. Well, yes, people in Russia say that. But even here, if you watch some media, they say, "Oh, you know, yeah, Ukraine was always part of Russia, and the Ukrainians should just rejoin." Uh, and which, of course, we know they don't want to do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing. They wouldn't be waging this war. But what do you say to people now that you have actually spent so much time in all of these countries that were former Soviet countries? Do they really want to rejoin an empire of yeah. sorts? So uh, before I answer that question and remind me if I forget to come back to this point, um, I just wanted to go back to the nuclear issue for one moment, which is yeah. that um, during the Cold War, we found ways to manage the risk with Russia. And that's where we need to get back to again. Uh, you know, some of the treaties, uh, some of the important understandings, um, some of the connections uh, between um, U.S. Uh, leadership, um, whether on the military or the civilian side, and the Russian side um, have been frayed. Uh, I mean, we are, I, I don't want to discount it. I mean, we are in a very dangerous moment right now. But we did it during the Cold War. We did it for decades of being able to manage that risk. And we can do it again. And so we just need to figure out how. Um, so I, I don't want to leave people uh, feeling that this is an impossible task because it's not. Uh, it's hard, um, but it's possible. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, how do people on the ground feel? Uh, I mean, I am sure uh, that there are some Ukrainians, some Kyrgyz, some Kazakhs who want to rejoin the, uh, you know, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union. Um, but that's not what most of them want. And their governments don't, uh, you know, are reflecting the will of their people. I mean, Zelensky, I mean, one of the things you can say about him is he, he is masterful at reflecting what his people want. And um, I mean, there's just no desire to return to the fold. And in the case of Ukraine, they've been fighting off the Russians for hundreds of years. Um, so this is, this is part of that resilience and that determination to resist um, the Russians that we are seeing right now. They've seen this before and they are gonna prevail this time. I mean, period paragraph. Um, I would also note to people that say, you know, these countries were part of Russia. Well, so was Alaska. Does that mean we're going to give up Alaska? Good point. Good point. So I have a question here uh, from the audience about how we can help the people of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, what are the organizations that you recommend? Yeah, so I actually have a list that I'm happy to share with you all. I mean, there are so many great organizations, um, but before I kind of go through the list, and maybe we can just put it up, um, you know, uh, for for people, I, um, I I think one of the things to 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 do to support Ukraine and and more broadly um, the democracies of the world, because I think the stakes are far greater than just Ukraine. I think what we can do is individuals can um, alert their elected representatives, whether it's in the state house or in Washington. Um, that they're watching this and they're concerned and they want to be supporting, you know, Ukraine um, and, you know, providing, you know, those citizen voices that, you, you know, our politicians, they want to be reelected and um, maybe they will be paying attention. I mean, I have to say um, uh, in the House uh, and in the Senate, there is bipart strong bipartisan support for Ukraine, but this is not a short term fight, unfortunately. This is going to need to be a sustained um, effort and American citizens saying, you know, we understand what the stakes are and we want to support Ukraine and we want you to do the necessary as our 
elected representatives, I think is hugely important. And then I think, you know, there are, are many different kinds of charities that provide humanitarian um, assistance. And um, I, I, I know the, um, the leadership of Rosam for Ukraine, which is basically a clearinghouse. I mean, they, um, they vet um, um, NGO, uh, non-governmental organizations that are providing assistance to Ukraine. They've been doing this uh, since, since 2014. So they have a good track record. And um, so that would be you know, one way to go. If you are somebody who believes in freedom of the press, which is, I certainly do, I think all Americans do, um, you know, it's so important for our democracy. And I just recall what Thomas Jefferson said that you know, if he had to, I mean, this is not a quote, obviously, but if he had to choose between a government and the press, he would always choose the press. So there's this organization called the Kiev Independent, and um, you can buy a subscription and they will send you every day, they will send you a little um, update on where Ukraine is now and you can up your membership to get you know, all sorts of exclusive products as well. But I, I read that every single day because it's, it's you know, my, in, in English, it's my ability to you know, get a quick update when I first wake up um, and it supports freedom of the press, which is hugely important in Ukraine right now, not only in a time of war, when we, we know that sometimes the press um, can be um, challenged, shall we say, but as um, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic always, and as Ukraine moves forward to a time of peace to ensure that there are still strong, um, strong press organizations that are gonna bring people the truth, because as hard as war is, um, peace actually can be a lot more challenging. Uh, so there's that. There's also um, a number of organizations that are providing assistance to the territorial defense organizations. So there's the big Ukrainian military, and then you know every community um, has um, you know had in, over the last two months has organized. And I mean these guys need everything. They they not only need tactical gear and radios and in some cases drones and uh, night vision goggles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They need medical kits. They need the right kind of shoes. Um, and there are a number of organizations that uh, I can provide you the name, the names of that, that, that do that. And then one organization that is very close to my heart is called Mountain Seed Foundation. And that provides assistance to, it started out uh, a number of years ago um, by some former US embassy employees, Americans, uh, to providing assistance to children in Ukraine. But in 20, um, this year, in 2022, it has started a second um, effort to provide assistance to the um, US embassy employees, Ukrainians. Um, these are you know, US government employees, no less than I was or any American is, and they are facing all the same challenges uh, that everybody else in Ukraine is. And so Mountain Seed is, is, is doing a great job of, of helping some of, um, some of our employees that need a lot of, a lot of assistance. And finally, there's an organization called Welcome USA. I'm on the board, and they are, um, uh, you know, getting ready to provide assistance to um, receive Ukrainian refugees into the United States. They started out by helping Afghanistan refugees, and now they have broadened out. So a really long answer to your question, um, but there's a lot of things that people can do and really provide meaningful assistance to the people of Ukraine. Thank you for all of those on watching us here. The, there's a PDF that was shared in the chat that has all the names of the organizations that Ambassador Yovanovitch just mentioned. So um, I kind of want to go to a philosophical question about who we are as people. I'm thinking about big tense mission and country over party, but also our mission here at Future Hindsight, where we try to find the ways everyday people can engage with these big issues. Can you help us understand how these themes we've discussed today, corruption, Ukraine, the undermining of institutions, how and why these should matter and do matter in fact to everyday people? Um, why corruption matters to everyday people? Oh, not corruption, but like all these themes about well, corruption, of course, too, not just corruption, but also what we're, what's happening in Ukraine, how are diplomacies working, the undermining of institutions, basically how our civic life is working and how we are operating as a society, both in the United States 
and of course as bilateral partners with other countries or even you know being a world leader uh, well, that's a very broad question, <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm actually going to be able to answer it, um, but I'll do the best I can. I mean, I think, you know, we are in challenging times. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, I think that if we, um, you know, just taking the domestic portion of it, if we had any doubt at all that our democracy is challenged at the moment here in the United States, you know, all you need to do is look at the January 6th insurrection. And so, um, you know, the, all of the leaks that are happening and uh, the information that is dribbling out makes it clear that there was, you know, one can only call it a conspiracy um, to overturn um, presidential elections. I mean, that is the elections are the very foundation of a democracy. And, um, you know, so this is a very serious thing. So I'm hoping that the January 6th um, committees our committee um, and the hearings that are coming up will provide uh, us with a lot of information and a lot of answers and some accountability for not just the people who invaded the Capitol and um, you know, committed violence, um, but those who organized it and funded it uh, and planned it. Um, you know, there needs to be accountability for this, not because we wanna look backwards necessarily, but because we wanna look forward and accountability is, again, one of the hallmarks of a country that is a rule of law country, where um, it is not you know, the rule of men that if you're a president or if you're close to the president or if you are rich, um, you get off um, because you have special privileges. We need to be a country that is the, uh, a rule of law country where everybody is held accountable for um, if they are guilty of crimes. Uh, I think that is um, pretty important. Um, in terms of you know the broader, and 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 I would also say that I think that um, our democracy is tied very closely to our diplomacy. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan used to talk about how we are the shining city on the hill, and I still believe we are. Maybe it's a little bit tarnished, but we are still the um, shining city on the hill. Um, but we need to get our act together uh, and continue to provide that inspiration to other countries because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, George Kennan, uh, you know, probably the most famous diplomat of the, 19, uh, the 1900s, where he noted, um, he was a, a Russia expert, and in a, in a telegram back to the um, U.S. government, he, he basically said um, that to fight the Russians, we need to be strong at home. We need, uh, you know, our values are our biggest asset, and we need to make sure that our democracy is strong, our, our, and our economy is strong. It's not the military that makes the U.S. what it is, as important as our strong military is. It's our values. And uh, I think that is still true today. And I think that um, when our country is strong, our democracy is strong, that gives our diplomacy, you know, it, it you know, it, it gives you wind under your wings, right? Um, and I, I look out at the world today, and I think we are very challenged. Um, we have been challenged, but now after February 24th, when the Russians invaded, I think looking back, we're not going to look at this as simply, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We're going to look at this as how did at the leaders of today. The United States, but also other leaders around the world, meet this moment because it is clear that we are being challenged in many different ways. And we need to define what those challenges are. I mean, you know, yes, there's nuclear, um, but there's also other challenges like cyber wars and disinformation, which is so corrosive to so many countries around the world. And the list goes on. I mean, what are those challenges? How do we define them? How do we uh, address them? Um, and we need to look at the institutions we have, the tools we have. Some of them are good and uh, some of them need to be reformed, like for example, the UN. Um, maybe we need new institutions and tools. We, I, I think, are, are at a moment like we were at the end of World War II when um, you know, our forefathers uh, said, you know, never again, we're not gonna have this kind of death and destruction. Um, we're gonna set up new rules uh, for the international order. And it's gonna be about the inviolability of borders, 
sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they, over decades, they set up new institutions like the UN, like the international financial institutions, et cetera. Um, we need to look at all that and figure out what do we need to keep? What do we need to reform? What do we need to create anew for the new challenges that, that we are being faced with today? So much to do, but it sounds like you are super hopeful. I mean, I know you're an optimist. You mentioned that already. Um, and so here's my final question. Looking yeah. into the future, when we think about the world, the new world order that is going to emerge when all is said and done, what, what makes you hopeful? Well, <laughs> so I think sometimes being hopeful is an act of discipline. Um, you know, I think about Colin Powell, who was, uh, of course, uh, a military man, um, and he became Secretary of State. I was a relatively junior officer, and he had these 13 rules. And one of them is that uh, optimism is a force multiplier. So we can go into this situation, um, you know, the, the challenges that we're facing right now and go, oh my God, there's just no way we can solve all these things. What are we going to do? Or we can say, you know, we've got some real problems here <laughs> and we are going to solve them. And how are we going to do that? And what are you going to do? And what are you going to do? How do we break it up into, you know, small problems that each of us can, can, can tackle and so forth? Um, because, um, you know, if you are optimistic, that spreads. And I'll give you two examples of why I am optimistic today. The first is here in America, where I, I deal with a lot of students. And they are just as, you know, optimistic and ready to tackle problems and excited about their new careers or their careers to be. Uh, you know, as I was when I was that age. And so, you know, e even though some of us are, are maybe a little, little more jaded, <laughs> young people aren't. And, and it is their world, and they are going to solve these problems. Um, and then the other thing that makes me optimistic, um, you know, along the lines of what Colin Powell said is, I mean, who thought that the Ukrainian military was going to be able to push back Russia? Who thought that? Very few people. I didn't think that. I, I knew that they'd give a good fight. I didn't think we'd see the kind of successes that we see now. But that is not only an example of capabilities, but it is an example of the will and the desire to achieve success and victory. And that's, that's the spirit that we need, I think, in all of our endeavors in order to, um, to move forward. Well, thank you very much for those words of wisdom and those hopeful words. Thank you very much for joining us, Ambassador. It was really a pleasure to have you on Big Tent. Thank you. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. There you go. All right, well, thank you both for such an engaging and insightful conversation. And I, I thank you, Ambassador, for your service to our country and to all for all that you've done and you continue to do in defending the principles of truth and democracy, both here and abroad. Thank you for being a real American hero. And, and I need to say that your memoir, Lessons from the Edge, is so full of both exciting and interesting details about life in the Foreign Service. I, I, I have to encourage everyone to read this remarkable story. As well, I, I wanna encourage everyone to listen to Mila's podcast, Future Hindsight. And just a quick reminder, as I've said earlier, we have J uh, Jocelyn Benson, Michigan Secretary of State, coming to talk to us next Tuesday at noon. And please don't forget to check out our website for other upcoming events, read our newsletter, and follow us on social media at Big Tent USA. With that, good night, and thank you all for joining us under the tent this evening. Thank you.